Hello, everyone. We'll get started now. I'm Jose Poro, Cobalt Water Global. I'm pleased to welcome you to our masterclass webinar series in conjunction with the launch of the book, Quantification and Modeling of Fugitive Greenhouse Gas Emissions from Urban Water Systems, which was published by IWA Publishing and was lead edited by Liu Ye of University of Queensland and co-edited by Ingmar Nopens of AM Team in Ghent University and myself. Today's masterclass, which is the second of four, is on monitoring, modeling, and mitigating wastewater nitrous oxide process emissions. We have an excellent lineup comprised of some of the book contributors. But before we jump into things, I want to thank IWA and ICAMI for hosting us and Amanda Lake of Jacobs for taking the initiative to help spread the word on the book and through this masterclass series, uh, but more importantly, for helping to inspire action and by engaging the water community with the content of the book. Thank you, Amanda, uh, for your leadership and passion for climate impact. So getting back to N2O, uh, when it comes to N2O, what is interesting is that we're essentially living in, in two realities. And I was explaining this to uh, an innovative water utility a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we have one reality, which is I consider to be an alternate reality because not consistent with the science or based on truth. And the other, uh, which is the one that is uh, based on science and, and seeking the truth about N2O because uh, in the alternate reality, we're using generic emission factors like those, uh, like the IPCC emission factors, which are not mm -hmm. capable of accurately accounting for N2O because of its extreme, um, because it is extremely site specific. But recognizing that this, this was one of the key motivators of the book, um, wanting to provide tools and methods for better getting to the truth about N2O. And if we can get to the truth on N2O, we can reduce N2O. So let's get things kicked off. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you your moderator, Dr. Maite Pijuan, who's the head of technologies and evaluation research area at the Catalan Institute for Water Research or ICRA. It's worth noting that Dr. Pijuan is quite the N2O expert herself uh, and has contributed a couple of the, a few of the chapters that helped contribute a few of the chapters in the book. I've had the pleasure and honor of working with her on several collaborations. And what's interesting is to point out is it was exciting because she came up with a way to an, alterna an alternative method for determining the emissions from non-aerated zones. And this is in the book. So without uh, further ado, uh, Maite, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jose, for the introduction and uh, welcome everyone. For me, it's a pleasure to chair this webinar on N2O monitoring, modeling, and mitigation in N2O. Um, I'm sure we will learn a lot. Uh, we have four fantastic uh, panelists, three of them from the academia that have contributed to this book, and another one, a special guest from uh, an industry um, from Australia. So uh, next slide, please. Before going into the presentations, just uh, to let you know that this masterclass series has been organized by the IWA Climate Smart Utilities Group, which is a platform aiming at knowledge exchange with two active subgroups. So if you are part of the IWA EWA community members and you're interested in this topic, please consider joining these activities of, of this group through the IWA Connect site. Please next. Just some practical information uh, of the webinar that will be recorded and may, made available to everyone free of charge uh, through the EWA website. Next, please. Also some practical information. Um, we'll have first four presentations with a brief Q&A section after each of them. Um, and at the end, we will have also discussion um, with a Q&A um, section. 
All the attendees, uh, you have the microphones muted and we cannot respond to raise hand. So if you have questions, please raise them by using the Q&A box. We will try to answer them along the way in the chat or, or later on in, in the Q&A section. Also, if you have a general requests that are not specific to the topic of this webinar, you can use the chat box. Please, next. That's a little bit of, of the agenda. We'll have um, these four panelists, as I was mentioning, uh, with 10 to 15 minutes presentations and then a short Q&A uh, discussion um, at the end of each talk, and then one or two little longer at the end of all the four speakers. And then we will end up with the final remarks and conclusions. Next slide, please. Well, just a picture of, of us. Uh, next, please. Also, we'll have a poll. Uh, we want to know where you guys work. Um, and then um, does the utility you work for have a, a net zero target? And also what action are you taking on, on, on trying to reduce this process emissions? Uh, I believe this poll will be open for all the, the webinar until the end. Next slide, please. Also, if you share your thoughts on this topic on social media, please tag us and don't forget to include the hashtags uh, we are mentioning. And uh, we are moving now to the, to the first uh, panelist. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Vanessa Parravicini. She's a researcher at the Institute of Water Quality and Resource Management at Uvin in Vienna, in Austria. And her research topics include industrial and municipal wastewater treatment, greenhouse gas emissions from wastewater treatment plants, life cycle assessment in urban water management, and biofilm from wastewater treatment systems. And uh, she is the leading author of chapter five of the book that focuses on full scale quantification and GHG emissions from urban wastewater systems. And in her presentation, she will explain us the different available methodologies to reliable quantify and to emissions from wastewater treatment plants. Please, Vanessa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mate, for the introduction. Hello, everybody. Um, well, I just check if I can control the slides. Yes. So, um, well, when aiming to mitigate and to emissions at wastewater treatment plants, it is imperative to understand the mechanism that trigger its formation. Therefore, my four slides will focus on the pathways of N2O generation. And in the second part of the presentation, I will focus more on the quantification methods for N2O uh, emissions at wastewater treatment plants. The majority of N2O production originates from microbial mediated nitrification and denitrification processes occurring in both terrestrial and aquatic systems and being also, we know, key processes in the biological treatment of wastewater. So during nitrification here on the left side, ammonium oxidizing bacteria, which perform the oxidation of ammonia to nitrite, are known to be able to produce large quantities of N2O as a byproduct of their metabolism. So two pathways have been postulated based on extensive studies. The first one is the hydroxylamine oxidation. And the second one is the autotrophic nitrite reduction, also called um, nitrifier denitrification. But uh, I think you will hear more about these uh, uh, two pathways in, in the next presentation. Uh, I just would like to say that the first pathway uh, seems to be favored under high ammonia oxidation rates. And the second one might be predominant under um, limited dissolved oxygen concentrations. On the other hand, on the right side, uh, heterotrophic denitrification has the potential to produce and to consume N2O. N2O is an obligatory intermediate in this process. It's not a byproduct. And being produced uh, along the multiple uh, reduction steps, um, starting from nitrate and leading to nitrogen gas. So when the process performs completely, N2O will not accumulate and the denitrification will act actually as a sink of N2O, having the potential of reducing also the dissolved uh, N2O previously produced by other processes, like uh, as the nitrification. However, in some cases, this last step from uh, uh, of the denitrification uh, of N2O to nitrogen gas 
um, may, may not be as efficient as the previous one. And uh, because it it's known that this step is more sensitive to environmental factors. So in these cases, uh, NGO will accumulate and then can be uh, released to the atmosphere. So the take home message here is for me, um, nitrification is a, a source of NGO and denitrification can be a source, but also a sink for N2. Based on these uh, fundamentals, it can be expected that the main sources of N2O emissions in mainstream wastewater treatment uh, processes will be uh, the units performing the nitrification and nitrification, with N2O being produced from both anoxic and aerobic zones. But the aerobic zone, of course, have been reported to contribute more to the emission of N2O, being this promoted there by the aeration stripping. In comparison, uh, in novel nitrogen removal processes uh, over partial nitritation and anamox processes, more intensive N2 emissions were found from uh, the aerobic zones. In the following anamox process, however, the anaerobic ammonium oxidation was not reported to produce N2. Um, several operational and environmental conditions are found to impact N2O generation and emission during nitrification and denitrification, including loading conditions, uh, dissolved oxygen concentration, pH value, temperature, and so on. And the same applies also to the substrate and intermediates of the nitrogen removal processes such as the concentration of ammonia, of nitrite, and during the denitrification, the availability of organic carbon. So the prediction on how NGO generation is influent, influenced by the different parameter is a quite challenging task. And as different conditions are applied simultaneously during the wastewater treatment process. But all in all, it can be said that process conditions supporting extensive nitrification and denitrification usually lead to lower N2O generation and emissions rate. The high number of triggering factors impacting N2O generation in wastewater treatment plants uh, is the main reason for the significant temporal and seasonal variability um, detected in measurement surveys up to date. And to describe these uh, dynamics, uh, a continuous online monitoring is a must. And this is the reason why the full-scale quantification of N2 uh, emissions requires uh, significant input of resources on site. So we are already moving um, to the uh, topic, full-scale quantification of N2 in wastewater treatment plants. And of course, this is quite important because a key to formulating strategies to control and reduce N2O uh, emissions, um, um, a key is the identification and the quantification of all the sources we have at the plant. And uh, so in the first, next slides, I would like to give a very short overview on some methods uh, that can be applied for the quantification of N2 emission at which was a treatment plant. You will find in the book uh, a much more detailed descriptions of the methods. Um, well, first of all, um, we have several methods. So how to select the most suitable one. The selection uh, of the suitable quantification method uh, is mainly dictated by the objective of the measurement being this the compliance with uh, greenhouse gas emissions protocols or the calibration validation of uh, prediction models uh, or the development of uh, mitigation strategies. So in each case, a different degree of information is required and this need to be considered in the selection of the method. Quantifying methods can be classified um, into plant-wide and process unit measurement approaches. Plant-wide quantification um, enables the determination of the overall and true emission as the plant, including sources that might be missed uh, when using a process unit method or might not be accessible. Uh, in contrast, the process unit approach identifies and quantifies single N2O emission sources 
allowing a much deeper understanding of the mechanism of the end two production and emission and how they are linked to the process parameter. Um, yes, one method for the plant-wide quantification uh, that has been already applied at wastewater treatment plants is the mobile tracer gas dispersion method. This uh, ground-based remote sensing method uh, uses a controlled release of a tracer gas uh, positioned at, at the plant, combined with measurements of atmospheric gas concentrations taken downwind of the target area, in this case, the wastewater treatment plant. So when the tracer gas is released at a constant rate from the emitting area, N2 emission rate can be then calculated in real time by relating the measured plume transverse concentration of N2O and of the tracer gas. So for the measurement, you need a mobile measurement platform, usually a vehicle equipped with the analyzers and a global navigation satellite system for recording the measurement locations. Um, among the process unit quantification methods, the floating hood method is probably the most common approach to sample the off-gas leaving the surface of activated sludge tanks with bubble aeration. This can be done with one or multiple hoods according to the local requirements on site. And uh, the off-gas stream captured by the hood um, is usually fed to an uh, online gas analyzer for the quantification of N2O. And to calculate the N2O flux um, out of, of, of the uh, activated sludge tank, you also need the off-gas flow rate of the tank. So this is also quite important input for the uh, estimation. In the uh, liquid to gas mass transfer method, uh, the approach is uh, different. Here, the N2O uh, concentration, also the, the N2O concentration in, in, the, as in the liquid phase is measured using, for example, a dissolved N2O probe. And the two uh, N2O emissions uh, to the gas phase is then estimated using a gas liquid transfer coefficient. So the KLA uh, coefficients of N2 across the gas liquid uh, interface. This uh, KLA value can be estimated uh, applying a theoretical or more empirical approaches. And uh, this calculation is not that uh, trivial. Uh, what is important to underline is that in both methods, uh, it is quite challenging to extrapolate the punctual measurement result to the total um, emission of the activated sludge tank. Um, well, in chapter, fi chapter five, uh, we put much effort um, in providing a general overview on the methodologies uh, currently available for the quantification of N2 emissions at wastewater treatment plant, of course, and um, well, highlighting also their field of uh, applicability, the instrumental requirements, the strengths and limitation of each method and recommendations in regard to supplemental data requirements and the duration of the measurement campaign are also given. So in conclusion, uh, can be said that significant um, improvement have been achieved in the quantification of N2 emissions at wastewater treatment plants in the past decade. And proceeding from grab sampling to online monitoring, from short-term to long-term measurements campaigns, from process units to plant-wide quantification methodologies. However, quantifying N2 emissions still remains a challenging task due to the special and um, temporal variability of the emission pattern, which are strongly influenced by the environmental and process conditions. So in this context, a widely implemented measurement protocol would help improving the quality of the data generated in these campaigns and the comparability of the result uh, would also be easier. At, at the moment, this widely implemented measurement protocol is still lacking. And additionally, um, well, I think further effort are necessary for linking N2 emissions with plant performance indicators and operational condition, because this, is, this link is the key for developing effective mitigation strategies. So in the end, I would like to acknowledge the authors of the book chapter two and five, 
book chapter two uh, focused on the generation mechanism of uh, N2O emission of N2O, and uh, the chapter five uh, focused more on the uh, quantification methodologies. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Vanessa, for your talk. I think it was a very nice um, overview of the mechanisms of N2O and also the different ways we have to quantify um, these gas emissions from wastewater treatment systems. Um, I believe we have one question from the chat that was referring more on the how you can quantify the flux uh, coming from the anoxic zones. Um, if, you, if you want to comment on that, like with the hood method, um, how you get the flux that comes from the anoxic tanks? Um, well, let's see. Um, so, if you are, of course, you are monitoring the concentration in the in the hood, so in the headspace of the hood, so you can uh, see according to the uh, the changing of the concentration there if you have. Uh, a production and also emission in the in the headspace of the hood. So you could uh, use, let's say, this somehow static uh, measurement method uh, to get there uh, in, if, let's say, an estimation. I mean, we know that uh, what is uh, emitted during the denitrification phases, it's um, not a very, as so it's uh, compared to what is emitted during the aeration phase, it's, it's uh, usually not that relevant in the whole balance. But of course, um, it's also interesting to uh, understand what's happening during these phases. And uh, if you uh, parallel to the um, measurement with the, the hood, uh, you also um, uh, use um, in, in the liquid phase uh, a probe, an actual probe, then this can also give you some more information on what's happening in the water. Because sometimes, of course, you have you cannot see immediately in the, in the hood what's happening. If if you have an internal loop in in the hood, and um, I mean you can also use some sweep gas, also maybe to have some circulation in the hood that can help. Yes, of course. Yeah, thanks, Vanessa. Just to complement on that, uh, mm -hmm. I have seen to to well, the method one was using the tracer test, um, a tracer gas, mm -hmm. um, which was is what you men mentioned. Uh, in, in our experience, we had a, a, an analyzer that was able to measure also oxygen. So we were using that as a swap, sweeping gas through the hood. And, um, and then we, were, we, we knew the concentration of oxygen in the air and then the concentration of oxygen coming out of the hood. And we could estimate the flux coming from these anoxic zones since they don't have any oxygen. So in a way, it was similar to it a tracer awesome. gas. <laughs> Um, and then it was also a, a comment, maybe the last one for, for this short Q&A session, that was um, how to make sure the, the, the section you cover with the hood is representative from the... <laughs> this is a very good the, question. <laughs> from the place you are measuring, since the tanks yes. are very big and the hoods are not so big. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a very good question. And um, yeah, of course, um, you, you have really to think about it. Um, I mean, if you have, a, a, let's say, a tank, uh, we, which is a quite uh, good mixed, um, I don't know, a tank with a circulating um, flow or really as a, a completely steered uh, tank reactor, uh, then probably you will not see a very high uh, concentration gradient as a, in terms of ammonium or nitrate. And so, I mean, of course, we usually do, uh, it's uh, a must at the beginning of a campaign to have some, uh, to monitor uh, at the different uh, points and, and see, uh, compare if you have a, let's say, a comparable uh, concentration or emissions. Um, so from our experience, if, if you have a quite uh, well-mixed uh, tank, then you will not see very much uh, uh, differences. And, but if you have a, a big gradient in the concentration, so a plug flow reactors, or if you're also measuring so several cascades, uh, then you are really to think about where you put the hoods. And sometimes it's really very, um, as a, it's, it's, it's a good idea not to use just one hood. Yeah, fully, fully agree. Um, I'm not sure if we lost Vanessa, but in, in any way, we have to move to the next. Um, Panelist, that okay. is. Uh, ah, I, lost, I couldn't hear you anymore. We lost you just for a, for a sec, but no problem. Okay. Uh, we can further discuss that later on in the in, at the end uh, of the talks. 
But now we need to move to the next panelist, that is Dr. Howran Duan. He's a research fellow at the Australian Center of Water and Environmental Biotechnology. Uh, for many of us, many know as the former Advanced Water Management Center at the University of Queensland. And his research focuses on novel wastewater treatment technologies, nitrous oxide emissions, and sludge management. And uh, he's the co author of several chapters in this book. So thanks, Haran, you have been very active in helping yeah. uh, to get this book out. And today he will get, uh, tell us all about this fantastic goal of end to end modeling and mitigation strategies. The platform is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mighty. Um, hello, everyone. Um, just my presentation will be like further to Vanessa's presentation on the moni monitoring and quantification of, of N2O emissions from wastewater treatment plants. As Vanessa has introduced, the um, um, production mechanism of N2O is quite complicated, gover governed by many different environmental factors. So if you vary one, you may not see direct, direct uh, consequence on the N2O emissions, but may have other relevant environmental factor changes. So really to understand into emission mechanisms, we will have to extract the mechanisms into mathematical modeling so we can better understand the regulation of into emissions in wastewater treatment plants. And with such modeling tools available, we would be able to more confidently develop mitigation strategies to um, to optimize our process design or process operation for less into emissions. Yeah, so uh, today I will be presenting mainly our chapter seven on modeling into production and emissions. This chapter is led by Professor Matthew Spernandio from INSA France. And in addition, some modeling relevant mitigation strategy uh, study from uh, a work that I did with some collaborators. Um, so if you are not that familiar with Antour modeling, Antour model is an extension of activated sludge model. So it's developed from activated sludge model ASM. And ASM is essentially uh, governed by two things, uh, reaction kinetics, which is also called monod kinetics, on the right-hand side, you will see two equations. Those two equations govern the consumption of substrates, and as well as, as a result of substrate consumption, the growth rate of microorganisms. Those two equations are um, uh, highly correlated. And essentially, if we knew all the consumption of substrates in wastewater system, we expand all these equations, then we can model all these reactions um, with a reaction stoichiometry. Um, down there, we see a matrix is a good example and also a simplified example of, of modeling. If we look at the first row, which we see the process rate, uh, which is just exactly the same as what we see up there in equation one and two governs the process rate. And with reaction stoichiometry, we will see how much substrate is consumed. For example, SO represents oxygen consumption and how much um, microorganism is grow as a result of this substrate consumption. And essentially, and essentially mathematical modeling is a mathematical representation of wastewater treatment processes that we, that, that we understood. Um, so now with advanced knowledge on entropy production mechanisms, we will be able to extract this understanding to build mathematical models. So now I'll quickly walk you through the development of many entropy models. Just refresh your memory a little bit. This is um, just a simplified version of entropy generation um, illustration, uh, a simpler one than that Vanessa just presented. Uh, so we have mainly three paths, uh, three main biological production pathways of N2O, two by ammonia oxidizing bacteria, AOB, um, namely nitrified denitrification pathway and hydroxylamine oxidation pathway. And we also have heterotrophic denitrification pathway carried out by heterotrophic 
denitrifying bacteria. And as for uh, ALB, initially there were four different single pathway models proposed, just uh, purely based on the mechanism that we understood. Model A and B on the right hand side shows two nitrified denitrification pathway model with only a minor difference whether hydrofilament was included in the conversion or not. And similarly, for hydrofilament oxidation pathway modeling, there, are, there were two models proposed and also with small differences on whether NO is included or uh, NOH is included. And intuitively, since those single pathway models were developed, and researchers later on combined them together, and the, 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 the model on the upper side shows a consolidated two pathway model still following the monokinetics. And an alternative model was also proposed since nitrified identification pathway takes electrons. So it was proposed there may be some electron uh, carrier shortage or it's regulated by electrons. So in this model proposed by me at UQ, they proposed electron carriers in the model to regulate the two pathway. And this two pathway model were later on uh, validated by isotope studies and showing the prediction of pathway contributions are very similar to what was measured by an uh, isotope studies. Um, so these AOB single pathway and two pathway models have its applicabilities. For single pathway model, obviously, it's only applicable when one single pathway is dominant under some environmental conditions, whereas uh, in the environmental conditions where none of these pathway dominant, instead both of them exist, then only two pathway model would be accurate to describe the two emissions under such, such scenario. Um, so similarly, after uh, the AOB pathways, for N2 emission from denitrification pathways, there were three uh, models developed. And the first one being the classic ASMN model. Basically, in this model, denitrification, each steps of denitrification were modeled from nitrate, nitrate to nitrite to NO to N2O, then NO. So we will be able to get N2 emission from these um, comprehensive stepwise modeling. Um, then later on, it was realized there were actually electron competition in the electrification process. Basically, some sub-steps may be more, more preferred for electrons. So um, Pan et al. at UQ proposed electron carriers in the electrification model called the ASM ICE. Basically, in this, in this model, electron carriers were added in. Um, more recently, um, an alternative modeling model was proposed by uh, Bats Mass Group at DTU. They used an electric circuit um, to resemble the electron, electron competition, basically using electric resistance to represent each steps to regulate the electrons that became available and how that is regulated, the N2 emissions in denitrification. And with all of these single pathway or two pathway models proposed, um, after all, it can be then unified to build a consolidated model, which, which includes all major pathways so that, so that it can be used to to describe until emissions at real wastewater systems. Um, so this is just an illustration of a previous work that we did um, for until mitigation. And we can see mathematical modeling plays a critical role in, in until mitigation. And um, then our next speaker will elaborate more on this. So I will just skip this. And um, with all the, our understanding in, in modeling, uh, we start to look at um, how until mitigation is governed. There has been many 
dental mitigation strategy, uh, studies in lab scale, pilot scale, and some recently also at full scale. Um, there are just too many um, to be summarized. And then we, 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 we dig into the depth and we start to, from a retrospective point of view, and we see it's all actually from the modeling. With the modeling that we understood the, the generation pathways of N2O, well, and we understand how these mitigation strategies strategies were developed. So if we, again, look from uh, N2O generation pathways, if we look at the hydroxylamine oxidation pathway, um, effectively, we, we knew that um, N2O emission from hydroxylamine oxidation pathway is re related to the AOR, ammonia oxidation rate, and which can be described in, in mathematical mod model in this equation. So we can see that if we are able to reduce AOR without compromising nutrient removal performance, we will be able to reduce N2 emissions. So here we can see from this equation, if we are able to reduce the, the ammonia concentration in the, in the reactor, or if we are able to reduce oxygen concentrations, we will be able to reduce N2 emissions from this pathway. And this is exactly why some, some studies uh, did a low DO or flow a flow equilibrium to reduce ammonia concentrations. And similarly, for N2O emission, for N2O generated from nitrified denitrification pathway, uh, it is governed in modeling by this equation. So similarly, we will be able to reduce nitride concentrations to reduce N2 emissions from this pathway. And also, since this pathway use electrons generated from hydroxylamine oxidation, so essentially, if we are able to reduce the electron um, supply from the other pathway, there is also um, a potential to reduce N2 emission from this pathway as well. And this similarly applies for denitrification pathway as well, uh, with the difference that in denitrification, there is a pathway for N2 generation, basically from NO reduction, as well as a sink for N N2O, namely the N2O reduction pathway. So if we are able to regulate the environmental conditions or the operational parameters to regulate NO reduction and maximizing N2O reduction, then we will be able to reduce N2O uh, in with water treatment systems. And as for the physical process of um, liquid mass transfer, um, if we are able to reduce the liquid to air transfer, we will also be able to limit N2 emissions from, from liquid phase. Uh, and finally, um, end of pipe treatment technology, such as capturing the gas and using biofilters to reduce N2 emissions. Um, as I said, there has been a lot of mitigation strategies and uh, proposed and developed. And in recent years, many have now been tested and demonstrated at full scale. I'm showing some examples here. Uh, like the first one was actually carried out by MIT's group. They um, changed continuous aeration to intermittent aeration at a, at a full-scale SBR plant and resulted in 90% reductions in N2 emissions. And the mechanism is um, from um, multiple pathways. And similarly, there has been other attempts in total I have seen four and um, more are expected to come since the mitigation is re uh, the modeling is really reaching a maturity. And so finally, take home message, Untold generation magnetism has greatly progressed in recent decades so that the Untold models were developed with these mechanisms. Um, in general, these are very similar, um, but with some different uh, mathematical structures. Um, until modeling has reached a maturity uh, that has been applied at full scale to estimate until emissions and guide until mitigation strategies development. Um, integration of until models into a plot-wide model could be a few powerful tool for future optimization works. Uh, and finally, um, until mitigation is also reaching a maturity and some have been demonstrated at full scale, um, but still more demonstrations are required. And I want to acknowledge uh, Professor Zhu Guoyuan and Associate Professor Liu Ye at UQ, who are leading the greenhouse gas research um, at the University of Queensland. 
also want to acknowledge Professor Matthew Spernan Deal, who is the lead author of Chapter uh, Seven, the modeling chapter. I also want to acknowledge our, our collaborator George Wells and Conrad Koch, who were um, co-authors of the mitigation paper. Thank you. Thanks, Howland, for this uh, very Thank indeed uh, yeah presentation on models and yeah many questions there. <laughs> Um, I haven't seen any specific question on your talk in, in the in the chat, but um, I will just uh, make maybe a general one to you, and, and maybe we can further discuss it at the end. So yeah. my understanding is, is it's very I'm not sure at this stage, but uh, it's very complicated to correctly model um, these emissions. They are variable across the day. They are variable uh, across the year. Um, one pathway, multiple pathways at the plant may behave in a different way. Plus we have the adaptation of the biomass that uh, is adapting to different um, stressors that they can have different emissions depending um, on the plant. So from your experience, what kind of experimental data do we need from, from the plant we want to model to ensure that uh, we have good model predictions? So. Should we start plugging N2O sensors in the plant in the SCADA to get this data as well? Uh, and to have, um, how, how much data do we need? Um, do we need one week of data? Do we need uh, a week per month during one year? Uh, what is your feeling? Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Um, yeah, n emission is highly dynamic. Um, so in terms of the, the monitoring, duration obviously one week or a few days wouldn't do the work um, many people who did uh, long-term monitoring have repeatedly observed uh, seasonal variations of n emissions um, so if you want to monitor n is if budget allows <laughs> um, it's better to do over a year monitoring to capture whether there is seasonal variation of n emissions and uh, so that's a question for duration and then for the for the um, variability of n emissions in treatment plants and how to model them um, yes modeling could be a, a big challenge at full scale if you have uh, changes um, so if we talking about some theoretical uh, on a theoretical ground if you don't vary your 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 operation that and your plant is operated um, smoothly and similar to what you experienced, then the model should still hold and the, the, the pathway uh, theoretically shouldn't change. But well, with for treatment plant, it's complicated. Everything could happen. And that is something which we still need to look at. And then consequently, um, online monitoring or, or or monitoring N2 as part of with what treatment plants routine monitoring would be helpful to address such um, uncertain uh, such uncertainties. Thanks. I can see that there is one question in the chat now. It says when it comes to mathematical modeling, is there a way to get around the computational limitations when it comes to full scale modeling? Is it is it is there a way to get around what? Sorry. The, the computational limitations. Computational limitation. Mm -hmm. oh, maybe if, if the person oh. that uh, did uh, make this uh, question can further um, explain what um, oh. she's referring to, and we can maybe discuss um, at the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because now, yeah, I think we need to move to the next one. Thanks a lot, Hauran, and then. Mm. We'll Thank see you, you at the end for the final discussion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, our next panelist um, is Dr. Ben Banden Acker. I hope my pronunciation is OK. Uh, ben is the lead with water scientist at the South Australian Water Corporation. He's also a John senior lecturer at Flinders University in South Australia and a John associate professor at the University of South Australia. He works on different research projects with the goal of improving the environmental performance and sustainability of wastewater treatment. And he also seeks to improve public health outcomes of water reuse schemes across South Australia. And in his presentation, he will tell us 
the end to monitoring campaign conducted in the largest wastewater treatment plant they are operating in South Australia and how that helps to, the, to implement mitigation strategies. Um, yeah, then the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, here we are. So just to provide some background, uh, I'm, I'm from South Australia. We are owned from by the government of South Australia. Uh, we are responsible for providing water and sewerage services to more than 1.7 million South Australians. And scope one emissions from our 24 wastewater treatment plants represent around 22% of our total corporate emissions. And and these, this scope one emissions are set to increase to 65% by 2030 due to greening of our electricity grid. So in the last 15 years, South Australia's energy supply has transitioned from 1% renewable to 60%. And in the coming years, uh, this will, uh, renewable energy will reach around 85%. So the, a lot of our focus will be on our scope one emissions, such as nitrous oxide. Uh, these emissions are currently estimated and we report these under a national greenhouse and energy reporting scheme. We have a target of net zero by 2030 uh, and to achieve this target, it will require direct monitoring to understand what our true emissions are. Uh, and direct monitoring will also be required if we want to explore the role that process optimization will play in reducing our scope one emissions. Now, the journey of, of monitoring our scope one emission started in 2012 uh, when during the introduction of a, of a carbon tax here in Australia, which was later revoked. Um, the focus for this work was on Bolivar wastewater treatment plant. This is our largest wastewater treatment plant. It actually has two activated sludge reactors. It has the step fed activated sludge reactor you can see at the top. Um, and it also has a smaller sequencing batch reactor. When it comes to our activated sludge uh, reactor, our step-fed reactor, what happens is we get spatial gradients in, in, in many parameters. You get spatial gradients in dissolved oxygen and nitrogen concentration and biomass concentration. And these can impact nitrous oxide production in different ways. So the focus of this work was trying to capture this spatial variability in nitrous oxide emission, as well as the diurnal variability. And this is, of course, required in order to enable accurate quantification of our emissions. But also in doing this, you can identify hotspots along the reactor and then identify potential causes for those high emissions. And this information can then be used to, I guess, target control measures. How can we make operational or design changes to the plant to try and reduce these emissions? So how did we quantify variability? Well, what we did was we developed a multiple gas hood system. Um, sorry, oh, the... Uh, yeah, so we developed a multiple gas hood system and that enabled, I guess, spatial and diurnal monitoring. So we were able to use multiple floating gas hoods. So we had a number of these floating gas hoods that would pipe the captured off gas to a centralized greenhouse gas monitoring unit. Um, we then, from each hood, we we're able to measure uh, temperature and pressure and flow rate. And we used the PLC computer, a uh, PLC controller to open and close gas solenoid valves to direct a portion of the gas from each hood to a single Hariba infrared uh, gas analyzer. So every five to six minutes, the analyzer was able to measure nitrous oxide emissions from multiple gas hoods that were located along the activated sludge reactor. And this is what it looked like in practice. So at the top, we were able to monitor um, from six locations, from six hoods positioned along the activated sludge reactor. Um, that's our step-fed reactor. And at the bottom, uh, we are able to monitor nitrous oxide from our sequencing batch reactor from three separate locations. And if you're after more information about the methodology that we applied here, you can see that in, in, in the paper that's been pub published here. What we also uh, did was under take intensive monitoring of, of a whole range of different water quality parameters that are listed here. And the aim of this is to try and identify relationships between these parameters and nitrous oxide uh, to try and understand uh, the production pathways that are responsible for nitrous oxide production. But also this information was also important to support and help calibrate uh, the development of a multi-pathway model that which Haran was previously talking about. In terms of key findings. The graph on the right shows uh, a diurnal profile of nitrous oxide measured from the six different locations in our activated sludge reactor. What you can see is there is pronounced diurnal variability, but also large 
spatial variability along the reactor. And this highlights the importance of the need to try and uh, monitor for multiple locations to try and incorporate and understand and characterize this variability. Once we incorporate this variability, what we found was that the emission factor for this particular plant was quite high. Almost 2% of the nitrogen going into the system was emitted as nitrous oxide. And that equated to around about 30 kilotons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. And when we compare this to our, uh, our uh, the use of a generic emission factor to estimate our emissions, we actually reported nine kilotons. So you can see there's a large discrepancy between what we measured and what we actually estimated using a generic emission factor. But in doing this, we're able to identify the causes and we're now taking steps to look at how we can mitigate this. And I'll talk about that in the next few slides. In terms of our sequencing batch reactor, despite being a well-mixed system, we still identified that there was spatial variability in nitrous oxide. And again, it stresses the need to make sure you capture the spatial variability from monitoring at multiple locations. The emission factor that we measured was close to 0.9%, which is what we what you usually expect and, and typical of, of this type of system. But we did identify that the way that the plant was aerated uh, aided in nitrous oxide uh, production, uh, and we took steps to try and mitigate that. So looking at ways to mitigate, we, we looked at ways to mitigate and try and reduce our nitrous oxide emissions with the support from a multi-pathway nitrous oxide model, which Haran previously talked about. So with the support of the University of Queensland, we are able to calibrate this model using long-term nitrous oxide data and also long-term process data as well. And uh, this model was really good at predicting emissions and, but, and also providing insights into the types of pathways that are probably responsible for the, for the emissions that we observed. Using this model, it's, it's great to be able to then customise design and operational changes. So what sort of changes can you make to the plant from an operation perspective or what sort of design changes can you make? And, and, and how do you make these change? And, and it allows us to assess these changes without actually compromising the performance of the plant and also uh, compromising the, the, increasing the cost of, of treatment as well. So just to give one example, the first is looking at operational improvements to our sequencing batch reactor. We noted that the aeration profile, so at the bottom in, in, in the brown there, we've got our dissolved oxygen profile. This aeration profile uh, in the brown uh, actually aided nitrous oxide production uh, via the hydroxyl amine oxidation pathway and also from denit a nitrified denitrification pathway. The model was then able to look at different DO profiles. So we looked at the profile strategy, uh, the DO profile in the red and also the blue. And we identified that by changing the DO profiles, the model identified that we could achieve around about a 35% reduction in nitrous oxide emissions if we, if we modified the aeration profile. What we did is we went for strategy two and with fine tuning of our dissolved oxygen set points at this plant, uh, we, 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 we implemented these, these changes and we went out and revalidated and, and measured nitrous oxide. And we found that uh, around about 30 to 35% reduction in nitrous oxide with just these simple uh, changes to the dissolved oxygen profiles. The reductions that we measured in nitrous oxide emissions were also consistent with the predictions of the model as well. The other important uh, point to make here is that in doing this, we also identified additional operational and performance benefits. Uh, not only did we observe an, a reduction in, in emissions, but we also were able to uh, observe an improvement in total nitrogen removal. We weren't over aerating the system, so we we're able to achieve about a 20% improvement in total nitrogen removal. And we also noted an, an improvement, about a 20% improvement or reduction in uh, energy that was associated with aeration as well. So not only did we achieve in uh, a, a higher level of nitrous oxide uh, reduction, but there's also additional operational and performance improvements. And if you're after more uh, information, uh, I please uh, I'll refer you to this, this paper that we published, which, which covers this topic in, in much greater detail. We're also looking at uh, design improvements, considering design improvements to our step-fed activated sludge reactor. What we found was the high emissions that were particularly noted in our in the second step feed of the reactor were actually was actually caused by an uneven biomass loading rate within within this reactor. 
Uh, and the reason for this was it was caused by the location of the return activated sludge. So the return activated sludge is returned to only the start of the reactor in the first step fed section. Um, and as a result, the mixed liquor concentration as it goes along the reactor uh, becomes diluted by the second step feed. So the, the mixed liquor concentration in the second uh, stage of the reactor is actually much lower. And as a result, the biomass loading rate in the section was much higher. So through the support of the, the model, we're, under, we're able to undergo, uh, you know, assess different scenarios. We assessed what would happen if we were able to return some of this RAS to the second step in order to try and even out the biomass loading rate across the reactor. Um, and what we found was looking at different scenarios, if we returned about 30% of the RAS to the second step, it showed potential to cut our nitrous oxide emissions by around about 16 kilotons of carbon dioxide per year. So, so quite significant uh, potential uh, with, with, with these sort of design changes. And again, if you'd like to see more information and, and know more about uh, this work and this model, uh, I'll refer you to this publication uh, that's presented here. So just to uh, finish, uh, I guess the, the take home message here is I guess the importance of, of good measurements and, and, and accurate data. Um, uh, it really does require the need to capture variability. So in order to have good measurements and good data, it's important to capture variability. I sh we've showed examples where there is pronounced variability in, in emissions along our reactors. And in doing this, we found that there is large discrepancy between the use of a generic emission factor versus what we actually went out and measured. And when you set out to, to, to capture this variability, you're able to identify hotspots along the reactor and, and this can then help us target better target control strategies. The other benefit of having good me measurements is you can generate an accurate model and use this model to try and understand and, and validate the causes for nitrous oxide emissions. And then using this model, you can customize and test different control, control strategies uh, in a way that you don't compromise the functional performance or the cost of wastewater treatment. Uh, and, and finally, uh, uh, finally uh, another, the final conclusion is that uh, from our work, operational improvements can play a major role in reducing emissions. Uh, from the work that we did on our sequencing batch reactor. And in doing so, additional benefits can also be gained in terms of cost reduction uh, and also other benefits to uh, improvements in the operational performance. Uh, before I finish, I'd also like to acknowledge the contribution of a number of members from the University of Queensland and also Peter Barr from SA Water from our water engineering technologies who developed the, uh, the, the, the online multiple gas monitoring system that we employed at Bolivar Wastewater Treatment Plant. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sven. This is um, a clear example of a nice collaboration between academ academia and industry, and the results are, are just fantastic. I mean, uh, sometimes um, we get some reluctancy in, um, in trying to, to establish the, the real emissions of, of our wastewater treatment plant, but uh, here you show how that can also have benefits, like economical benefits. You obtain like a reduction on, on the aviation and a reduction of costs so, uh, and a reduction of emissions. So that's, that's all fantastic. We have many questions for you <laughs> in the chat. So we'll maybe can answer here a couple of, of them. Uh, yeah, one is uh, how does reducing the DO concentration impact the nitrification process? Uh, as, as I'm assuming, well, here it says that the work needs to meet the final uh, F1 ammonia concentration. So that's relating on the fact that, that uh, how you manage to reduce the aviation without affecting uh, your F1 ammonia. We, we, we didn't necessarily reduce aeration, but we just mm -hmm. changed the delivery of dissolved oxygen delivery, so the set point. So what we found was that the intermittent and the ramping up and the ramping down of, of dissolved oxygen actually contributed to nitrous oxide uh, via um, uh, you know the higher the higher DO contributed th through the uh, hydroxyl amine oxidation pathway, and also we found under low DO we we're getting a nitrite accumulation, so nitrify denitrification. Um, so it, it was about pr providing, I guess, a more even supply of oxygen, not necessarily reducing it down, um, but also we were 
uh, I guess there was evidence of, I guess, simultaneous nitrification, denitrification occurring as well at those at those levels. But yeah, I just want to stress the fact that it's not so much necessarily reducing. We, we went from a, an intermittent uh, aeration profile to more of a, an even supply of, of oxygen. Does it have an effect on the energy consumption of the plant? Uh, I guess that what we found is we're, we're actually at times over aerating the plant. Mm, mm. So we're actually over aerating. And as a result, we were actually getting a lot of nitrate accumulating as well. So by reducing that waste, we're able to achieve a reduction, uh, not in only nitrous oxide, but uh, prevented nitrate from accumulating and also uh, minimized energy consumption that was associated with, with the over aeration. Mm -hmm. Oof, there are many, many questions in the chat. <laughs> Maybe you can answer some of them uh, directly, uh, specific questions. There was a question on the model uh, the University of Queensland use. Um, let me see. What I can also do is to, is provide the links to the, the papers. All yeah. of this work was was public yeah. published, uh, particularly around the model as well. Um, hmm. Yeah, I think most of the questions can be found uh, in, the, in the papers. And uh, well, just, uh, just to finalize, how did the biology respond to operating at continuous lower VO level? Uh, in terms of the, the biomass concentration and the settlability, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there were small, there was a small, um, uh, I guess, the, 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 the settlability, the sludge volume index suffered a little bit, but not, not mm -hmm. too much. So there was a, an increase in, in uh, a reduction in the settlability, but, but it was still manageable. Thanks a lot, uh, Ben. I think we need to move to the next and last speaker. Thank that you very is much. Dr. Basilea Basilaki. Uh, she is a research fellow at the Brunel University in London and is working on process emissions and on the development of artificial intelligence based water and environmental solutions. And she's author of, author of seven papers on this topic, including a summary of 10 years of monitoring of N2O, which ha was the first time a global data set was developed and analyzed across process types. So I'm sure most of the audience have, yeah, are familiar with this work. Uh, she's also the first author of chapter six of the book, which focuses on full-scale emission results, and also is a co-author of chapter 10, that is focused on knowledge-based data, data-driven approaches for assessing uh, GHG emissions from wastewater treatment plants. And in her presentation, she will give us a summary of these two chapters. Basilea, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maite. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Just to check that I can control the presentation. Great. OK. Uh, just a little bit background about our R&D activities at Brunel University. We are a group of uh, 20 researchers working with Professor Ravina Katsu on understanding and mitigation of process emissions and on tools and frameworks for the sustainability and circularity assessment and monitoring control and optimization of water processes. In this presentation, we will discuss about chapter six and 10 of the book uh, on process emissions and specifically about global end to all studies and innovative data use. Uh, there have been more than 20 years since the scientific community started monitoring the N2O emissions in full-scale reactors. Today, we will summarize what we have learned until now from all the studies and how we can use the knowledge accumulated to improve our understanding on process emissions mitigation. We now know that the significant amounts of N2O can be generated and emitted during biological nutrients removal. N2 emissions can contribute up to 78% to the operational carbon footprint of the plant. This means that in order to work towards carbon neutral plants, N2 emissions and their mitigations need to be considered. This is not very straightforward since studies have resulted in conflicting findings in terms of triggering operational conditions and long-term dynamics cannot be fully explained yet. This is because the complex relationships, as we saw even in the previous uh, presentations, 
that exist between the N2O generation and operational conditions, and because different interactions uh, of the operational variables can trigger a different response on N2O generation. Uh, but now let's see what we report in this new uh, publication on process emissions. We have analyzed the quantified emission factors, triggering mechanisms, and mitigation measures in over 80 full-scale wastewater treatment systems. Uh, the taxonomy reported in the book considers the process type uh, and wastewater treatment plant size, environmental and operational conditions, process control parameters, and efficiency indicators. We have also proposed mitigation measures for the reduction of high end low risks and innovative uh, data utilization methods based on the existing studies. To be able to better understand the results uh, and the work undertaken, let's first see some uh, typical profiles of nitrous oxide. As you can see in the figure uh, on the top left, there is a huge seasonal variation. Uh, this is an example from a wastewater treatment plant in Netherlands. And we can see that along the year, emissions can be from almost zero to up to 200 kilograms uh, of N2O per day. Studies have also shown that it is possible for emissions to vary from one year to the next. This means that the long-term campaigns are necessary to quantify emission factors and that any mitigation strategy needs to be dynamic to cope with the dynamic variation of triggering factors. We also expect a diurnal variation, as you can see in the typical profiles on the figure in the right, and as we saw in the previous presentation, spatial variation. Uh, one of the first things we did when we collected all this data from the studies is that we developed box plots uh, of the emission factors, as you can see in the figure on the left, top left, uh, for different configurations and groups of processes. Specific processes, such as side stream uh, processes treat treating high strength streams, are associated with high risk of elevated emissions, while in conventional processes, uh, we expect the emissions to range between 0.2 to 2% of the nitrogen load. And this is a huge variation in terms of carbon footprint uh, impacts. Uh, but are all these emission factors reliable? In the figure on the bottom, uh, you can see the emission factor values with respect to the length of the monitoring period. The average emission factor for long-term campaigns is equal to 1.7% of the nitrogen load, whereas monitoring campaigns lasting less than a month have a, an average emission factor equal to 0.7%. And this is exactly because uh, we saw that emissions can vary significantly during the year, and this can impact a lot uh, the reliability of the emission factors we have quantified. Specific patterns of N2 emissions uh, have been also identified. Uh, they can depend on the process performance and control, the type of biological treatment, the slug treatment, among other factors that you can find in the relevant chapter in the book. Uh, as an example, plants that have anaerobic digestion on site and feed the anaerobic supernatant into the um, main line, into the biological process, have a median emission factor equal to 1.5% of the nitrogen load. On the other hand, wastewater treatment plants that have applied other sludge treatment strategies, such as sludge drying, uh, have a median emission factor equal to 0.11% of the nitrogen load. And uh, what does this mean? It means uh, that we should do better in the future, not only in the design of the monitoring strategies, but also in the data we collect and report to develop meaningful benchmarks for different processes. In the book, we have also summarized, uh, summarized the knowledge accumulated for triggering, con triggering conditions for specific uh, groups of processes and the respective mitigation uh, measures that have been identified. Uh, this is a simplified example uh, for the processes removing nitrogen, 
several conditions have been linked with elevated emissions risks, such as the insufficient dissolved oxygen. Uh, we, we have seen in, increased tripping due to elevated aeration rate and elevated nitrite concentration, among several other factors. Uh, the knowledge on what triggers emissions uh, has resulted in the development of mitigation strategies uh, related to the control of ammonia oxidation rates, the modification of the control of dissolved oxygen, uh, improved understanding on the effect of the, the mixed liquor suspended solid concentration, and several other mitigation factors, as we saw uh, in the slides in the previous presentations. Uh, we have also seen that uh, the role of data in understanding and mitigation uh, of emissions is very, very significant. In fact, several studies have shown that the sensor data and laboratory analysis from wastewater treatment processes contain hidden information that can be valorized to explain and control the long-term dynamics uh, of N2O emissions and triggering operational conditions. Uh, we believe that there are definitely better ways to monitor, control, and manage uh, our wastewater treatment processes. So in the book, we present some recent success stories and practical examples of the capabilities opening up when we leverage the information uh, hidden in raw data. Uh, I will present uh, some examples today from chapter 10 of the book. Uh, this is an example uh, from uh, Cobalt Water uh, Global, who have uh, developed an n uh, risk decision support system. The tool uses uh, knowledge-based artificial intelligence and machine learning to propose process adjustment. Here we can see an example with the proposed dissolved oxygen in light blue uh, and the actual dissolved oxygen in gray. Before and after the adjustment, we can see when the adjustment starts uh, because uh, the actual dissolved oxygen is much closer to the suggested uh, BO. Uh, here we can see uh, the behavior of nitrous oxide before and after uh, the adjustment. It is the line in purple. Uh, we can see that after the adjustment, the N2O reduces significantly. Uh, in uh, light green, we can see a machine learning model that predicted this N2O reduction. In this example, up to 70% reduction of N2O was achieved. Several examples of uh, data utilization from our own work and other works are presented in the book. Uh, we can see uh, how uh, we can use data to minimize N2O sampling requirements for the reliable quantification uh, of annual emission factors. Uh, this is when uh, we do not want to, monitoring, to monitor for one year continuously. Uh, in practice, we have shown that uh, AI-guided sampling strategies can result in the most reliable annual uh, N2O emission factors com compared to conventional intermittent sampling uh, methods, such as monthly uh, sampling. We also see examples on how to detect uh, abnormal events, uh, change points in the behavior of the system, and how to apply clustering, classification, regression algorithms to translate data into actionable information, link the N2O ranges with specific operational conditions, predict the range of emissions based on the operational environmental conditions, and provide feedback for the mitigation measures. Uh, the introduction of uh, data-driven models allows water professionals to understand and improve the environmental performance profile of their operations and potentially dynamically control the emissions. So to conclude, just a short take-home message. Uh, Process-based and to quantification, benchmarking and mitigation, we know it is still challenging, but uh, structured approaches for monitoring and knowledge discovery from uh, wastewater databases, reinforced by a combination of domain knowledge, data mining techniques, and mechanistic models, uh, are powerful tools to support 
uh, wastewater treatment plant carbon neutrality targets and to facilitate the integration of sustainability metrics uh, in the decision making. Uh, I would like uh, to thank a lot also the um, co-authors of uh, chapter six, Maite, uh, Hauran, uh, and Tevina, uh, and also uh, for chapter 10, Jose Poro, who is the lead author, and uh, Giacomo Bellanti and Tevina. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Basilea. That was the last uh, talk, uh, and very interesting. We have as well several questions for you, maybe um, just a quick one, and then we can go to the five minutes, all of us discussion. One is why does emission go up during part of the year that you have shown? Uh, there are several interpretations for this. Uh, for example, we've seen that uh, in several plants, um, there is a, a peak of emissions and increase of emissions during uh, Easter. So when the temperature goes from lower temperatures and increases. And this has been potentially attributed to inhibition of uh, uh, nitrite, uh, of NOB, nitrite oxidizing uh, bacteria. Uh, but there are several, several environmental and operational factors that can lead to uh, temporal changes in the emissions behavior. Thank you. Now I will invite all of the panelists if they can switch on the microphones and, uh, and the cameras, just to have maybe, maybe five to six minutes um, of uh, discussion. And we can address some of the comments we have and questions we have been seeing in the Q&A section. Okay, that's one maybe more general, but uh, what will be the best method to easily monitor and to all? Uh, maybe now this one to Vanessa, if you can comment. Um, it will depend on the type of plan. Um, you think uh, maybe a plan-wide model will benefit some plants and, and others can benefit more from process unit. And also it will depend, I guess, on the, how much they can spend on the monitoring. Yeah, of course, <clears throat> there are several factors that need to be considered. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, well, as I said in the, in the presentation, first of all, I think you have to uh, ask yourself, what do you want to, uh, to measure? So what is the goal of your measurements? I mean, if it's just, if, if you just need the, the uh, total uh, amount of, of N2O emitted, uh, just to have an, an first uh, idea on how high it is, will be, and maybe you have to comply with some uh, greenhouse gas emissions protocols and so on, uh, then of course you can go for the, the overall uh, approach. Um, uh, if you need more detailed information because you want to link the N2 emissions with the process condition because you want to implement some mitigation um, strategies, at the plant, and of course, it's these overall emission measurements uh, will not give you this kind of, of degree of information. So you uh, you have to then uh, go for a unit, uh, um, a process unit measurement. I will go more into details. Uh, of course, there are also some local conditions that um, needs to be considered. Um, I think it was already mentioned if you have, uh, for example, a, a surface aerators and not uh, bubble um, um, aerators, then of course you have to consider this when deciding to go for the hood or um, to have the measurement in the, in the liquid phase. And as you said, the cost is also a very important point, especially when you are um, we are um, designing also the, also the duration of the campaign. And I mean, of course, if, if it's possible to have a very long uh, measurement campaign, it's, it's always an advantage, but sometimes it's not possible due to the, the yeah, quite high input of resource in, in, in all of this. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the most important things, so you have, of course, to catch some seasonal variation, as probably you know your plant, uh, Best. So if you know that there are seasonal variation in the temperature, but also in the loading, then of course to have measurement in both uh, these periods, of course you have to have uh, at least some weeks, some months would be even better really to monitor also the fluctuation of the load and how they are impacting the plant uh, and the N2 emissions. Mm -hmm. And 
yeah so in the end i think it's uh it's always um, it has to be really specifically defined first of all for the goal of the measurement and also of, to consider mm. the site conditions you have at the plant just yeah, very generally said mm. following that is uh, in recent years has been becoming more more and more popular to monitor this oven tool um you can also plug the sensors on the scale and get this data almost online and um one of the audience and person in the audience was asking if it would be necessary to develop this two-phase model for predicting N2O since uh, we have most of the data in the, from the liquid phase um, monitored at full scale. And maybe that's a question for Howard Ann. Um, um, do you think it's, uh, yeah, we could uh, target to develop this, uh, this, this model and also including this stripping, which seems quite um, critical to estimate emissions of N2O. Yeah, yeah, I see, I see where that question is coming from. Uh, yeah, so liquid monitoring of N2O is obviously more easily available rather than having a complicated hood and analyzer setup. Um, the two phase model, I'm not sure I completely get you. Um, but it's sort of um, in all the models we model into generations in liquid phase. Mm -hmm. Then we model a, a a transfer from liquid to gas phase. Okay. So that is a two phase model. And I think maybe you, if you, maybe the the people who asked this was referring to um, a simple uh, mass mm. transfer model. Mm. Just uh, mm. yeah, yeah, and. Um, so uh, then, then the question is really how to estimate the KLA. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the model itself is just a, a simple equa equation. Um, the, the real issue is how to determine KLA. And yeah. I think I saw in the chat box, uh, Michael was there, who was a CTO of Unisense. Uh, we just had a chat some days ago about the KLA estimation. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is quite tricky. Um, many treatment plants is doing um, having a hood set up as well as a liquid and tool monitoring uh, simultaneously so that they can calibrate the KLA with mm -hmm. the hood measurement and the liquid measurement. Then they um, determine the relationship and use, use such equation to um, mm -hmm. estimate and tool emissions. Um, but then for treatment plants who do not have hood set up, um, things became a little bit tricky. So the mm -hmm. current recommendation recommended method by uh, Unisense is a method developed by uh, Jeff Foley at the University of Queensland. They use small uh, reactors and uh, also grab samples at full scale, and uh, use a empirical equation to estimate the KLA, which um, um, may be good, but may also have some issues, require mm -hmm. some improvement. Well, yeah, to summarize, it will be the most accurate will be to use uh, experimental KLA approach to have this hood there and experiment it, test the, P, the KLA in your plan. If you don't have the resources, then you can go to this more, maybe um, yeah, less accurate, but uh, easy to but better than IPCC. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And maybe a final question. There are many, but uh, <clears throat> just to finish this webinar, maybe this one goes on Ben. Uh, what are the main motivators for motivations for wastewater treatment plant managers to reduce N2O? Is it uh, claiming emissions reductions? Is it improving pro process performance? Is it uh, to help uh, reduce global warming? <laughs> it's, a, it's a very good question. Uh, our initial driver was that Australia introduced a carbon tax and we had the mm -hmm. choice of using a generic emission factor or going out and, and measure the emissions. So the use of a generic emission factor, we didn't know whether our emissions were above or below it. Because um, So what we did was we, we took the chance to go out and, and measure directly. And, and what we found was that our emissions were much higher than the use of a generic emission factor, which meant that our liability in car carbon tax was going to be much higher as well. Um, what happened is quite quickly, the, there was a change in government and the carbon tax was revoked. But we then had all this information in terms about what our true emissions were. Um, and then trying, I guess, to identify steps that we could reduce the emissions. And I guess also, um, so there was no, I guess, no financial incentives, incentive. It was just a, 
uh, it was just, I guess, an opportunity working with the University of Queensland. We, we'd done this work and then we thought, okay, what can we do next? Um, how can we reduce these emissions? And it, it, basically there was no real driver. There was no real incentive at the time. It was just, I guess, an opportunity to work uh, you know, industry working with the university collaboratively. Um, but now the driver has returned. You know, we, we've set a target of net zero uh, mm -hmm. by 2030. And so we now need to go out and, and, and repeat some of this work and, and monitor again to, to see if our emissions have changed. Um, so, yeah, initially there was no real driver. Um, but but now that driver has returned, and 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 there will there will be a financial incentive to to continue this work. Well, thank you very much. I think that uh, we are running out of time. Um, maybe well, first of all, to thank um, all the audience. Um, I hope you find uh, this webinar interesting. For yeah, it was a thing. We cover most of the current state of the art of the N2O emissions and monitoring, and we saw some examples of how uh, mitigation strategies can be applied full scale. Um, and now I will just, just to finish with some yeah, announcement on next webinars. It's this one that will take place uh, on the 25th of May on complete ammonia oxidizers. Also, I would like to mention that there is another uh, masterclass of this webinar series on the 23rd of June that, uh, that will be focused just on methane emissions uh, for you if you want to start registering. Uh, and I'm not sure, yeah, next slide, please. We have another announcement. Um, I hope to see many of you in the upcoming Iwa World Water Congress uh, that has to be, had to be postponed last year and this year will take place in the fantastic Copenhagen in September. And uh, yeah, I think, yeah. And also uh, please, if you're not part of IWA, you can, you can join this 20% this discount uh, on the new memberships and yes, Thank you, all the panelists. Uh, thank you, IWA, to organize these fantastic webinars. And thank you all for uh, your attendance. And I hope you to see you soon in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, everyone. You.